Well, hello and welcome to WMB Church Online. My name is Michelle. I'm a pastor at WMB, and I'm so glad to welcome you today on behalf of our team. Thanks for joining us. If you're new to WMB or you're watching us online for the first time, I encourage you to check out our website. You can find info about more ways to connect online during the week and how to get involved at WMB, even during our current lockdown. You can also connect with us on social media as our church is active on both Facebook and Instagram. And this month on Facebook, we're digging into the topic of mental health, including real and honest conversations on Facebook Live. We'd love to have you interact with us and ask your questions during the segments on Wednesdays at noon, or you can also watch the conversations later on our Facebook page. And this month, as a church, we're also reading through the Gospel of John together. It's not too late to join in, and you can find a reading plan and a guide to the book of John on our website. And if you've been following along already, what are you discovering as you read? I'm posting weekly videos and questions in our community group on Facebook, and I'd love to hear from you and have you join the conversation. And now, as we begin a time of worship, we look to our faithful and loving God. And whatever space you're in for this moment, you can sing loud, you can listen well. Let the words of these songs fill your heart as we sing together. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for this day, for the gift of coming together to worship as a church family, as a community, uh, even when we can't be physically together, we're united by your spirit and we worship you as one body. Would you speak to us today? Would you encourage each person as they worship you? And would all that we do as your church bring you glory? We worship you and praise you today and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, greetings from WMB Church. We are excited that you have tuned in with us today. And Psalm 121 says to lift our eyes up. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. We will have a chance to sing a song towards the end of the service. But now we want to unite our hearts as we focus on God's blessings. Even in tough times, there are still blessings. Because if we don't praise him, even the rocks will cry out. So let us sing together about the blessings of God. Yeah. 
say that we're so grateful for your ongoing support of the mission and vision of WMD through your financial giving. Your faithful giving and all of your generosity is such a blessing, not only to our church, but also to so many in our local community and for our partners around the world. And if you would like to give electronically, you can use the give links on our website or through our church app.
Now, before our message begins, I'm excited to share that at the end of our service, we have a special video of a recent baptism at WMB. During lockdown, our baptisms are being done privately at our Waterloo site to be in align with the current safety regulations for COVID-19. But we're excited to share these significant moments with our church family as a part of our online services. And now I'd like to introduce Pastor Sean as we continue in our series from the book of John, All In. So get comfortable, have something ready to take some notes, and let's hear from God's word together. Well, hey everyone, my name is Sean Branton and I'm one of the pastors here at WMB. And I'm so glad that you're joining us today for this second message in our series called All In, where we take a look at some individuals in the book of John who encountered Jesus and became all in followers of him. There's this funny little word in the English language that can have a whole world of possible meanings. The word is second. According to the dictionary, it could mean being number two in a sequence, like second in time or in order. Another definition is inferior in position, so like lower in importance. We've even invented some common phrases that have to do with this word second. Here's a few examples. Second place, on second thought, second guessing. Second class, second to none, a second chance. Now let me tell you a little story about this last saying, a second chance. Perhaps you've heard of this small British rock group called the Beatles. Did you know that they were actually rejected at their first audition with Decca Records? It was New Year's Day of 1962. Surely the band was a little tired from celebrating the night before and more than a little nervous at their first big audition. I mean, these guys were barely 20 years old and didn't have a ton of experience. They played about 15 songs, mostly covers, which honestly weren't that good if you've ever heard them. The person at the record label famously said to the Beatles manager that he thought that guitar groups are on the way out. Well, no one really remembers his name now, but the, the whole world simply remembers him as the man who turned down the Beatles. The Beatles manager took a recording of part of that exact same session to another label where they found a second chance, enough interest to offer them a second audition at Abbey Road. And the rest, as they say, is history. So today, we'll encounter someone who very much needed a second chance and got much more than that when he encountered Jesus. Last week, Pastor Adam kicked off our series, and I hope that you've started reading through the book of John with us together as a church. Sometimes when you're reading through scripture, it's a good idea to be reading with the end in mind. John certainly wrote his gospel with a specific intention. He writes near the end of the book, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Now that's worth repeating, isn't it? So that you can believe in Jesus and have life. So when we think about the story that we're going to read today, we're going to focus in on the fact that Jesus comes looking for an individual, not just once, but even a second time, because he wants him to believe and let me tell you, I'm so glad that on this journey of trying to live a Jesus-filled life, he keeps coming back to me over and over again in the midst of all my ups and downs in every situation in my life. Let's take a look at this text today, listening carefully so that we might be able to see ourselves in this story, to hear what God wants to say to us today. If you have a Bible handy, turn with me to John chapter 9. The reading is a little bit long, so instead of reading it all at once, we'll read in chunks and discuss it as we go along. Let's begin. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. 
His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. This is one of several stories of the healing of a blind person that we find in Jesus' ministry. It's like he has a special mission for the blind. We learn later that this man is a beggar. And you might know that people who begged for money and had a physical disability were very much marginalized in Jesus' time. That would have meant he was largely cut off from every area of society, not just being in community with other people, but would, he would have been excluded from the spiritual community too. He wouldn't have been allowed to go to the temple to worship. And the disciples demonstrate the way this man was viewed by his community for us right here. They assume that the person is this way because of sin. If you remember back to our series on the book of Job, it was pretty common for people in Jesus' time to subscribe to the retribution principle. In other words, bad people have bad things happen to them, and good people have good things happen to them. But Jesus is quick to correct this thinking. He says clearly, no way, that's not it. It was neither this man nor his parents. Jesus is saying that the condition of the man isn't about whether he deserved it or not. Let's just jump over to Romans 3.23 for a second. It says there, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's the thing I'm trying to get you to see today. We are all like this blind man in a way. We all have a pre-existing condition that we're born with. The human condition. The condition of being born into a world broken by sin. We too are born with a blindness, a spiritual blindness. But Jesus comes to this man, just like he comes to us. Because remember, Jesus is ultimately interested in giving you and me and this blind man a second chance to have a relationship with him. So as we continue to study this text today, I want us to consider this question. How does Jesus open our spiritual eyes and give us a second chance at a relationship with Him. The first way He does this is by giving us a second glance. He notices us like He noticed the blind guy who nobody cared about. We can feel rejected, unloved, unworthy, unimportant, and yet He sees us. And so just like the Beatles who thought they were going to be nothing, who were rejected on the first attempt, who thought they had a real shot to make it, but then this man at the record label couldn't see it. It took someone else to come along to give them a second glance to see the potential for them. Jesus could see it in this man born blind. He sees the same thing in you and me. He knows that if we put our trust in him, we can be fully activated people of his kingdom. And that's why he comes to this man. That's why he's coming to you and me today, just like it says in verse 3, so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And he makes the whole mission clear in verse 4 and 5. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus must work so that God's work may be displayed in the man's life. God had not made the man blind in order to show his glory. God didn't allow sin, pain, suffering and brokenness to enter into our lives in order to show his glory. No, God sent Jesus to do works of healing in order to show his glory. If you feel like you've been left behind by people, 
situations or, or whatever's going on in your life, I want you to know that Jesus sees you. He loves you. And he's looking at you today. More than anything, he wants a relationship. An all-in kind of relationship with you because he is all in for you. Now, perhaps you're feeling pretty good about everything going on in your life today. What's the point of this story for me? I'm already all in with Jesus. How can I see myself in this story? Well, I want to point out a, a tiny little word in verse 4. The word we. I want to remind you that this mission wasn't just a task for Jesus alone. No, we must do the works of him who sent me. Jesus is telling his disciples, and it's the same for us today, that there's work that needs to be done. It's the work of healing the sick, caring for the poor, reaching out to the brokenhearted. And that's a job that isn't finished this side of heaven. If you want to talk about a mega theme in scripture, it's this. Do whatever you can to help the suffering, the marginalized, the poor. Who do you need to see with new eyes today? Eyes that see like Jesus does. Eyes that see deeper and see the potential for each person. Jesus cares enough to stop and give individuals a second glance. How else does Jesus open our spiritual eyes and give us a second chance? Let's pick up reading at verse 8. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? They asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. I don't want to say too much in the middle here because we have lots to cover, but I just love how simple the blind man is in his testimony. Some guy called Jesus, made some mud, put it on my eyes, told me to go wash. I went and washed, and I could see. I also want you to watch how the blind man's own understanding of Jesus shifts through the story. Notice here how even though he's already been healed of his blindness, he hasn't really formed much of an opinion yet about who Jesus is. All he's got right now is that he is the man they call Jesus. I want you to pay attention to this as we move on. Reading from verse 13, the people aren't really sure what to do with all this either. So they take it up with the Pharisees. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. But others asked, some of the, sorry, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. Okay, the blind man has made a pretty significant leap here. He's gone from the man they call Jesus to he is a prophet. A prophet in those days would be recognized as someone who God spoke to. And someone who speaks to the people for God. Well, indeed, Jesus is a prophet, but he's more than that, obviously. He is God. It's something that the Pharisees cannot understand. And it's obvious that the blind man hasn't quite worked it out yet. The Pharisees are looking for further reason to disprove this whole thing. And so they bring in the blind man's parents. They still did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. 
He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Let me just push pause again here for one second. We don't really have too much time to go into all this, but you heard from Adam last week, and you'll probably hear it again somewhere else in the series, that there's a cost associated with coming to an all-in belief in Jesus. This man, he's now been fully healed. He would have been able to re-enter society, had a second chance at life. And almost instantly, some pressure comes along in the questions of the Pharisees. He's in a risky position of losing everything he's just gained. But you see, friends, another way that Jesus opens our spiritual eyes and gives us a second chance for relationship with him is by helping us to avoid second guessing. His parents wanted nothing to do with it. So they quickly jump out of the way. And the blind man, well, he could have gone along with the same kind of answer. Second guess the whole thing. Given in to the pressure of the Pharisees and not stood up for Jesus. Not told the truth of all that was going on. But he didn't. He answered simply, honestly, and even in his limited understanding of who Jesus really is at this point, He's unable to deny that Jesus performed this miracle in his life. And he's putting himself at risk. I wonder, where have you already experienced this kind of pressure on your faith? One of our discipleship characteristics is being willing to take, actively take risks for the sake of the kingdom. Are you willing to stand up as a witness like the blind man has? Who may you need to stand up to or give a testimony to? Not willing to give up easily, the Pharisees want to question the blind man again. Let's jump back in here and see what happens. Verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God and tell the truth. They said, we know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. The Pharisees sure do have an established position about Jesus, don't they? In verse 22, they had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Jesus has only been at work for about two years at this point. They already have a completely formed opinion of who Jesus is and who he isn't, and what's going to be okay, and what's not, which leads to them second-guessing the whole event. Because this healing happened on the Sabbath, and the specific way that Jesus did it, which was not allowed according to the Pharisees' Sabbath rules, they just couldn't get past it. The only thing they could understand is that Jesus was breaking their laws, and therefore he must be a sinner. But notice the difference between the blind man and the Pharisees. The Pharisees are so quick to second guess, so sure that Jesus can't have done this miracle and that he's certainly not a prophet or acting on God's behalf because we know that God spoke to Moses. 
We know that God does not listen to sinners. And the blind man, he just doesn't get caught up in all that. He says, I don't know about all that. But what I do know is that nobody has ever done this thing before. And so if he were not from God, he could do nothing. He's really come a long way in a short time on his position about who Jesus is. From the man they call Jesus to a prophet, all the way to his implication here that Jesus must be from God. But that's the truth. His experience with Jesus is so undeniable that he's able to avoid second guessing. There are a lot of people like the Pharisees out there who have some preconceived notions about what's right and what's wrong, what's cool and what's unacceptable. Maybe you had a good thing going with Jesus at one point in your relationship, something pure, something innocent, a childlike faith, and yet we're confronted by a world full of agendas, full of people that would want us to second guess things, to sway us from the truth to their point of view. In that case, holding to the truth comes at a cost. If you ask a bunch of people, everyone has an opinion. Like the person who said no to the Beatles because guitar bands are on the way out. People have declared the end of Christianity for years. No one is going to church anymore. No one is going to go back to church. But those are secondary opinions. And they keep on turning out to be wrong. The church keeps growing, especially on a global level. It changes, and though it might not look like what it used to, thankfully, people keep coming to Jesus. Second opinions might be interesting, but second guessing is not going to be spiritually helpful. Everybody has their own opinions about Jesus, and just like the Pharisees who are pressing in on the blind man, they're trying to get you to second guess the thing you've experienced to confuse the undeniable fact that your eyes have been opened by Jesus himself. Lots of voices are saying, he's this, or he's this. But in the end, they are simply spiritually blind. The Jesus they preach has nothing to do with the Jesus that is made clear to us by Scripture. And so maybe today you find yourself in a place where you've been waylaid on your spiritual journey by second-guessing, that's come by giving in to the temptation to listen to those who are spiritually blind too. This whole story, this message, is about Jesus opening your eyes so that you might believe in him. Jesus comes along and he's willing to break through barriers, searching for you so that he can give you a second chance at a relationship with him. Will you allow him to break through the noise that might be surrounding you? Will you fight your way through the voices of fear, the voices of preconception and opinion to come to the source of your healing today? Will you consider who Jesus is based on his life, God's word, what Jesus has done and what he is still doing? Again, if you've already made an all-in commitment to Jesus, would you ask him to search your heart for ways in which you've grown maybe a little too close to the place of the Pharisees and run back to him with a simple faith, like the blind man who says, I don't know about all that, but what I do know is I was blind and now I see. Jesus has given us a second glance, even when no one else might have been willing to, calling us from the corners of society to the very center of his heart. He's also helping us to avoid second-guessing the truth from the harmful and distracting opinions of others that stand in the way of us getting to a true and deeper understanding of who He is and what His truth is in our lives. I wonder if there's just one more way today that we could see how Jesus opens our spiritual eyes and gives us a second chance for our relationship with Him. All right, Jesus who's been gone for the past 27 verses, pops back into the story here at verse 35. We have no idea where he went. And then all of a sudden, he shows up again. Isn't it amazing that Jesus comes back to this man who has been pressed by the Pharisees? Doubts might be bubbling up in him. But instead of leaving him on his own, Jesus comes back to him. 
to give him an even deeper, loving interaction with him, really opening his eyes to who he is. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, just in case Son of Man is an unfamiliar term for you, it wouldn't have been unfamiliar to those who knew the Old Testament because it's used in Daniel, speaking of someone who comes down from heaven. We can find it in all four Gospels, and obviously Jesus even uses it to describe himself. What he really meant when he used this term was that although he appeared as an ordinary man, in him was the supernatural powers of the kingdom of God. Jesus wants us to hear that there is a more profound view of his person. Wrapped up in this term are all kinds of implications that Jesus is not just a man or son of man, but actually the Messiah, the very son of God. And so he's really asking the blind man, do you believe in the Messiah? Let's see how he responds. Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Deep in the very being of the blind man, deep in the very being of you and I, there's a desire to know God. It's imprinted there because we are his creation. And our innermost being desires for the connection to be restored that had been severed by the spiritual blindness of sin that we were all born with. And then Jesus makes it all, well, plain to see. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Now the man's blindness is completely removed. Not only has his physical blindness been completely restored, but here his spiritual blindness has finally been restored. And this man has come to a position of being all in for Jesus. No longer is he the man they call Jesus or a prophet or even from God. No, now he is Lord and he receives the man's worship. Jesus is coming and giving you a second chance to believe in him. The reason that Jesus comes to this guy at the end is because his eyes are open, and he could see that Jesus is different, but he had not yet believed in him. Jesus comes to him, just like he comes to you and me today, with a second chance to believe in him, to be all in. So what have we learned today, friends? Remember that all of these stories are given to help you believe in him. So how do you see yourself in this story? Can you see Jesus today as the one who chases you down, who longs for you to know him and to be in an all-in relationship with you? I really believe that this message that you're listening to right now, you just happen to be sitting where you're sitting, and this is no mistake. It's no coincidence that you're hearing this because Jesus is coming to you right where you are, and he wants to find you. You're seeing him, but he wants you to believe. Let me say that again. Maybe today, for the very first time, your eyes have been opened to the amazing love and person of Jesus, the one who pursues you right there in the midst of your situation, overcomes the opposition in your life, and is asking you the question today. Do you believe? He wants you to make that decision to believe in him fully today, to be all in. And friend, if you're hearing this story for the second, third, fourth, or 100th time, and you've been faithfully following Jesus, I wonder, how have you responded to what Jesus has done in your life? When the blind man believed, he worshiped Jesus. The fruit of our belief is worship. So what does that fruit of the all-in life look like for you? Have you testified to Jesus' work in your life like the blind man, even if it meant rejection? How are you joining Jesus in the works that he's calling his disciples to do, to be light in this dark world? You may not see yourself as anything special, 
You might feel like the equivalent of a few kids banging the drums in a garage in Liverpool. But Jesus sees potential for you. He wants you on his team. First and foremost, Jesus' mission is to gather all people to him and restore them in relationship. He wants to sign you to an eternal record deal because he knows that in doing that, we will make sweet, sweet music together. Friends, he can and he will do amazing things in your life. My prayer for you is that you would turn all of these things that Jesus has done for you back around. That you would give Jesus a second glance. That you would stop second guessing his good intentions to love you and to heal you in every way. And that you would look at every single day beyond today as a second chance for an all-in relationship in your life. On the greatest adventure of following Jesus with your whole life. As we've looked at this story with fresh eyes today, I pray that you would hear it as though it was the first time. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart, asking you once again if you believe in the Son of Man, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. As you ask the blind man's question again today, who is he? Show me so that I may believe in him. I pray that you would hear his voice whispering in your ear. You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And that you would acknowledge, Lord, I believe. And that you would worship him both in your heart today and in the way you decide to go all in. To follow him with your whole life, fully devoted. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you come after us. Not even once but a second time, all our lives chasing us down in the midst of every situation that we face, longing for us to believe in you and to worship you with our whole lives. Lord, would we hear with fresh ears and see with fresh eyes again today that you are Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and you want to restore us completely in every way and activate us as people of your kingdom, God, would we go in your name, healed, restored, and sent by you, Jesus, to be light in this world. That's my prayer for us today. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Sean, for leading us through the story of the man born blind and his experience with Jesus. As Sean asked, how do you see yourself in this story? I hope you're encouraged by the reminder of how Jesus pursues us and invites us into an all-in relationship with him. And now, as I said earlier, we're excited to share with you a video of a recent baptism that was held in a small private service on our Waterloo site on April 17th. So let's hear now from one of our youngest disciples of what it means for her to be all-in for Jesus. It is among the highest honor as a parent to introduce you to our daughter, Elliot Chain, and uh, to my dear friend, Emma, and one of Ellie's mentors. Go ahead, go ahead Ellie. Can I take my mask off? Yes. I have always lived in a Christian home surrounded by Christ, but I haven't always felt connected to God. Before I knew Christ and before I committed my life to Jesus, I thought I had the most perfect life and I didn't want any part of it, my life to change by letting Jesus into my life. Finally, one night when I was five, I was laying in my bed with my mom and we prayed and I accepted the Lord into my life. On April 5th this year, I was having a hard day. My best friend wasn't talk to, talking to me, and I was feeling stuck at school. And that night, after my parents had left the room, I burst into tears. I was feeling alone, and I felt like all of my previous friendships have turned, hadn't turned out and had faded away into nothing. As I was crying, I started to pray, 
But it wasn't my typical prayer. I was saying more than just words, and it meant more than just a prayer. It felt like a calling. After I said amen, shortly after I realized that God was trying to tell me something, so I ran to my parents' room and told them what had just happened. I told them what that I wanted to be baptized. The end of 2019 and throughout 2020 had been rough for me. I was moving out of the home that I had lived in my whole life and moving away from my friends after only knowing them for two years. I wanted to have the best school year so that when I left, I didn't feel disappointed. But then March break got extended to three weeks instead of one, leaving me worried and wondering if COVID was going to end soon or if it was gonna last forever. And when I never got back to school, and said goodbye to my friends. It felt more like forever. At that point, I wasn't really connected to God other than I was praying before dinner, praying before bed, and going to church every Sunday. But other than that, nothing was really happening between me and God. The summer of 2020 was difficult. No more sleepovers, Canada's wonderland, any gatherings inside or outside or traveling, and almost every fun summer activity. After summer was, <laughs> and summer was definitely my favorite season, so to see it go to waste was hard. But I can say that it was definitely a summer to remember, and one that I always will. It was full of different experiences and new memories. It was filled with things that I hadn't thought of doing, like tubing or watching a movie outside at night under a big tree. School had finally started. I was pretty nervous because I was starting at a brand new school, knowing absolutely no one and not being able to see anyone's faces. The first couple of weeks were hard, but I adjusted and learned. At this point, I was starting to realize that I really needed God, and I started praying for friends. And God under answered that prayer. He invited people into my life so that I now have many friends and even stronger friendships with the people in my class than I did at my old school. God answers prayer. He can do all things, and he cares about me. I started to read the Psalms at, as, win, as my winter days got longer. As I was reading Psalm 4, I noticed a verse that stood out to me. Psalm 4, verse 4 to 5. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. This verse stood out to me because at the time I was often angry. And, I, and as I read it, it didn't feel like I was just reading the Bible. It felt like God was reading the verse to me directly. I've started to think who God really is in each of our lives and what he can and has done for people. He's done miracles, saved lives, worked through and with people. He has calmed storms and flooded lands. He has given eyes to see and ears to hear, and he will do it all again. I decided to get baptized because I felt when I prayed to God, he was telling me that I was ready. I am ready to obey Jesus in baptism and follow him all of my days. Jesus said, let the children come to me. And indeed, you're ready. So, Elliot, put your hands up here. Do you believe that Jesus lived, died, and rose again to save you from your sins and give you life eternal with him? Yes. And do you choose to follow him all of your days as Lord of your life? Yes. Upon the confession of your faith, my dear girl, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. you 
so much, Elliot, for sharing with us about your journey with Jesus. We're so glad that you're a part of our church family. And thank you all for joining us for worship and teaching. And don't go away. If you're watching our Sunday morning live premiere, we'd love to see you in our virtual foyer now. This is a great place to connect with others, for casual conversation, or to meet privately with someone for prayer. And if you're watching this during the week, check out our church website for more ways to connect or how to receive prayer. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. We hope to see you again soon and blessings to you this week.